Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of The County Seat. We are back, and uh, we have a lot of things to talk about. Now, the show going forward from this point is going to be about broader issues, and they won't necessarily be just on Utah. They will be region-wide. And, of course, one of the most pressing issues all across the West is water. Uh, it comes up in almost every conversation, intrastate and interstate, because it's such a precious, uh, precious resource. Water hasn't always been a problem, and people attribute a lot of it to climate change and population growth. But there are some other things to consider, and that is one of the conversations that we thought we should start with. And who else better to talk to than the retired snow survey uh, coordinator, is that it? Yep. You bet. For uh, the state of Utah, worked for a number of years. I first met Randy in 1992, and I felt like a young Paduan at the foot of the Jedi Master even back then. Randy, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. I would like to talk a little bit about, uh, about water and all of the elements from your experience that impact this. Mm -hmm. Okay, there, there, uh, you, you enlightened me that there were other things beyond just drought, climatic conditions, uh, you know, El Nino weather patterns that affect uh, water. So what's kind of the broad shotgun approach to all the things that affect what water we have on hand? Uh, of course, the primary driver always is precipitation. Um, with climate change, we anticipate that uh, warmer kinds of uh, weather We'll get a little less snow, maybe a little more precipitation. The studies that we have done have shown that the state of Utah gets 98% plus of its overall stream flow from snowmelt and snowmelt processes. In other words, rain on snow and those kinds of things. Um, and of course, so that is the, the, the major thing. But when you, you look at a watershed itself, Mm -hmm. um, you have this snowpack that uh, accumulates and it melts and it comes down into the streams and fills the lakes and reservoirs and does all that kind of thing. Stream flow is the last check paid in the watershed budget. Uh, and the way I say that is uh, stream flow is typically a residual. When you have snow melt, it proceeds at a slow enough pace, typically um, anywhere between quarter of an inch mm -hmm. to maybe two inches per day. Uh, you can get more uh, snow melt than that on uh, rare occasions and things like that, but th that tends to be the norm. And most of the time it's between, when snow melt is really going, it's between one and two inches. That allows a huge uh, period of time for that uh, snow melt to infiltrate the soils. In fact, most of the stream flow across the watershed has passed through a soil mantle of some kind on its way to the, the stream. Really? Uh, yes, indeed. The vast, vast majority. You have um, uh, snow that sits directly on top of the stream and in that saturated area right next to it that doesn't. I mean, it comes right straight in. And if you get uh, um, snow melt that is really excessively high, you get overland flow. Same with uh, precipitation. You can overwhelm that system uh, to where you get lots of uh, runoff off of there. But that is, that's not the general rule. So um, how much of this ends up being aquifers that shows up in springs at different places? I, I know mm -hmm. there was a, a, a place in, um, in Tooele, or not Tooele County, but in Uinta County, uh, outside of Vernal, and, and they had a lot of springs in this canyon, and they decided to build a, a log flume to bring water down. As soon as they built the log flume high up in the mountains and put it in the trough, the springs all dried up. Interesting. And, and they, uh, uh, uh -huh. some of that flume is still there, and mm -hmm. some of the historians out there make a point of it. But, but how, much, how much aquifer action uh, uh, that we see in artesian wells and, and, and groundwater wells in the bottom of the valleys, uh, mm -hmm. it is how much of that runoff is coming from those? Um, <clears throat> virtually all of that is coming from uh, subsurface flows uh, from streams, uh, rivers, and that kind of thing, where th there's a small recharge area around the edges of most of the valleys where you get enough flow that goes down deep and will travel horizontally. And it takes many, many years for that water to go from here at this point, clear over, and then pop up as a spring. On the watershed itself, um, that uh, um, 
The snowmelt goes down into the soil and travels typically horizontally till it hits the stream. Uh, when you have snowmelt, that small area of the stream channel itself and um, immediately adjacent to it, a couple of hundred yards, is what becomes very saturated and produces those high, super high flows that we see from snowmelt runoff. It's all coming from a relatively small portion of the watershed itself. When we look at the, the overall watershed um, here in Utah, that, a huge majority of that watershed is not connected to the stream itself. Um, it gets enough snow to saturate maybe the upper 30 inches, I, 35 I, I, inches of yeah. soil. I recall that because mm -hmm. there was a year we had, uh, it, we'd been really dry for a couple of years. It wasn't that long ago. I, I, don't think, I think it was before you retired. And we had a big heavy snow melt. And I think your advice to people was, well, that's all going to go into recharge the soil. You're not going to really see any of it in the lakes. Right. When you, when you have a soil moisture deficit, the soil is essentially a sponge, and it can hold and retain a certain amount of water. Uh, and that's, that's the point. Uh, large areas of our watershed only have enough uh, snowpack, 10 to 15 inches of water, to saturate the first upper 30, 35 inches of that soil. That soil mantle holds that in place, and then the trees and brush and grasses all and evaporation, transpiration, all this kind of stuff takes that water out and never, never makes it to the, the stream. A uh, small, smaller portion of the watershed mm -hmm. that's directly adjacent to the streams and very high elevation um, where you have, say, instead of 10 inches of snow water equivalent, you'll have 20, 30, 40 inches of water. Um, and short distances to an impermeable, impermeable surface, you know, a clay layer, a mm -hmm. bedrock or something like that. Those are the actual areas that generate water across the watersheds here in the state of Utah. Most of the watershed is disconnected on an annual basis from that stream channel. And we, we know that because we t take a look at the, the well data mm -hmm. and see how far the aquifer is below the surface. Uh, if you're uh, even, uh, 100, 200 yards away from the stream channel itself, mm -hmm. the distance to that uh, aquifer may be as much as 50 to 100, 150 feet. You can't get, there's not enough water to make it down to that aquifer and then go horizontally to the stream to, to do it on an, uh, on an annual basis. So we look at that and we say, Stream flow is the last check paid. Everything else goes out. So you're looking uh, on most watersheds, depending on where you actually measure, um, anywhere between 30 and upwards of 80, 90 percent of the water on that watershed being consumed by the watershed. I would like to talk about, you know, where we're, where water is not getting into the system. Uh, you know, across the West, every time there's a fire. Every time there's, you know, an area that's drought, it is 100% blamed on climate change. Mm -hmm. And there, there are a lot of other things that are affecting water getting into it. What are some of you, the important things you think that are taking water away? You know, is it, the, is it the rancher who's, you know, pumping water to grow alfalfa in the desert? How much impact does he have on these urban watersheds? Mm -hmm. that, that would be my next question. <clears throat> Let's... Uh... Trace the path of a snowflake, shall we? Okay. You have a storm come over your watershed, and you got all these little snowflakes that fall down. Mm -hmm. The first thing that they encounter on the watershed are trees, conifers, mm -hmm. yeah, aspens, all kind, just a myriad of of uh, places where you can hang up on a tree. If you have conifers, uh, thirty to forty percent of the snowpack that falls out of the sky right there is going to hang on those branches and then through a process called sublimation what you have is these trees are sticking up quite uh, a ways above the ground you have the wind that comes along there and um, we've uh, there's actually been studies that show how long it takes a snowflake if it's blowing through the wind to go from a snowflake to completely sublimated and gone and so you have the the wind passing by there 
and the vast majority of all that snow that hangs up on those trees is sublimated back into the atmosphere and lost from the watershed. Never makes it to the ground. Does the same thing happen with, with aspen and cottonwoods and other types of trees? When, that's the great thing about aspens, the difference between aspens and conifers. Um, if you have an open meadow and it uh, eventually becomes uh, um, vegetated with aspens, mm -hmm. you'll lose about 20% of your snowpack. If that subsequently becomes conifers, which it has over the uh, past hundred years, you'll lose 40% uh, of your snowpack right off the bat. Then, so the more trees, the greater the, the, the loss to your snowpack right there. If you have uh, trees that are spaced, say, 20, 30, 40 feet apart, you have uh, huge areas in between that that snowpack actually hits the ground, will melt and go uh, and possibly become stream flow at some point in time. And so the denser your trees, uh, the higher they are, the, um, the thicker the canopy of your trees, ergo conifers over aspens, um, the more snow you lose to that sublimation feature. Like on the Colorado River Basin, Dale Bartos, he's the aspen guru, says we've lost two and a half million acres of aspen land to conifer encroachment. And subsequently, we've lost another 20 to 30 percent of our snowpack in those areas because it hangs on the conifers. Aspens uh, allow far more snow to hit the ground. There will be people who will argue that say, well, if you convert uh, conifer to aspen, it's not going to work because aspen don't grow on a north exposure or they don't grow well. Is that true? Aspen grow well where, wherever they have uh, decent soil and enough sunlight. Conifers will always win out over aspens over the long run because they come in and then they choke out the sun and the aspens uh, can't compete against that kind of a situation. So if you look, you know, if, if, if I were to drive across the Wolf, Wolf Creek Pass mm -hmm. in the autumn, I would see, when I'm looking at a south exposure, an east exposure, a west exposure, I'd see aspen there. Mm -hmm. On the north exposure, I mostly see conifers. Is that just because... They've outcompeted the aspen. They've outcompeted the aspen there. Absolutely. Uh -huh. And so, um, going on with our snowflake, if it hits the ground and becomes snowpack, it's uh, basically, there's some evaporative processes that go across the, the surface of the snow, but snow is a tremendous insulator. And so, um, a lot of heat is not transferred into the, so, into the snowpack, it's mostly solar radiation. So once it's on the ground, it's typically there. Uh, you lose a little bit, um, mostly because of wind conditions and things like that. So you need some trees to break the wind pattern. Um, and not only to break the wind pattern, but when you break the wind pattern, downwind of that, you create these huge drifts of snow. So having a mosaic of trees across your watershed, primarily of aspens and conifers and things of that nature, a nice mix with lots of open meadows, uh, small openings in there, is the best overall method of increasing snowpack on your watershed itself. When the snow melts, it goes into the, into the soil. Okay. And from there, it's, it's a free-for-all. Every root that's inside that watershed right there for that period of time, uh, basically April through uh, mid-July, is taking as much water as they possibly can through the evaporating uh, and transpirative processes right here. The more plants you have, the more water goes out through that transpiration feature. Is, is it also true that the bigger the plant is, the more water it will consume per plant? Typically, yes. When you have larger trees, they're going to take, <clears throat> physically, they require more water. But that can be uh, outweighed by the sheer number of smaller trees on your watershed itself. Sure. And that's, that's the thing that uh, once you get past July into August and things like that, uh, the watershed itself is water limited and the trees are water limited. They shrink back to basically survival mode right here. Uh, the more roots you have, the better chance you have of, of more water. But fewer trees in that situation right there mm -hmm. uh, typically means more water in your, the potential for more water going down your watershed. Um, 
been lots of experimentation done on this. The, the best one was at Fool's Creek in, on the Fraser National Forest. Mm -hmm. They clear cut one watershed, kept one watershed intact. And the clear cut watershed uh, produced 40% more water than the other one for the next 20 years. Question though, mm -hmm. was that one more susceptible to flooding and flood damage? Because there Absolutely, was, uh, because you've taken all the trees off of it. So we, we have uh, an example where you have a complete clear cut and in most places, that's not a desirable uh, condition, especially when you get into watersheds that have steep gradients, steep slopes, and things like that. Uh, clear cutting is an option in a lot of places in the Pacific Northwest where you have terrain that will sustain that, mm -hmm. and you come back in and replant. So there, the other part of this whole thing is uh, people would say, well, let's just cut a few trees and we can generate a little bit more water. It doesn't really work that way. We know the condition where we are, and we know what happens when we can do a clear cut. We don't know anything really in between that and how much water, how many trees it would take to actually budge the needle. There are some people who would say the only way to get our forests in the West back under control is to hand cut and hand thin trees, take just a few out to create that little bit of space in a forest and do that forest wide. Then there's another school of thought that says, leave, leave patches, like you're saying, a mosaic, mm -hmm. and open up more, more meadows that are, are stabilized by grasses or sage or whatever else would, would grow in that area, and then leave the tree stands strategically placed uh, to, to be the wind blocks, but still allow that trans, uh, trans whatever. Enough of the water and yeah. enough stability on the watershed right here, but you have to have enough <clears throat> that you can actually move the needle to produce water. Now, that's a fascinating thing because um, what our forests here today are are nothing similar to where they were 100 years ago. And I think that's an important point because a huge a point lot of because people. people love their forest. You know, it, it's our forest lands, and this is the only condition that they've ever known. And when you talk to them about well, we need to thin, not only thin the entire forest, but we need to take and recreate a lot of these open meadows and places like that across the watershed. Um, it's hard for them to process that kind of a thing, but that is the absolute best thing for the watershed. It's the best thing for biodiversity. It's the best thing for water production, and it's the best thing for making a fire resilient forest. So you have all of those factors going across your watershed. If um, you were, back in the turn of the century, we were, since nobody was putting fires out, a fire would burn until it either ran out of fuel, it was put out by summer precipitation, or winter came. And so uh, it's very easily burning 30 million acres a year, perhaps uh, much, much more than that. Yeah, but uh, when a fire takes an area out, it takes everything it out. Takes it takes it out. And it leaves flood waters. Uh, I mean, to spring, if they have a heavy snowpack, you're going to have mud, you're going to have a lot of turgidity in the water, you're going to create a lot of problems. I mean, even like in the Bryan Head fire, you look at Panguitch, mm -hmm. their entire spring structure was destroyed because the fire got so hot it burnt down into the roots and mm -hmm. it allowed, you know, rodent feces and other things to get in and contaminate the water supply. It seems to me that fire isn't, it's, it's a great tool in the toolbox, but I certainly wouldn't want it on my municipal watershed. That is the situation that we have created today. Because back in the earlier time, you know, uh, turn of the century, 1900s, mm -hmm. what you had was a forest that was acclimated to fire because fire came through on a fairly regular basis. It b killed a lot of the small conifers. It allowed far more aspens to grow, and aspens don't burn like conifers do. And since we have suppressed fire for so many years, we have gone from a situation where we used to have maybe 10 to 20 trees per acre to upwards, uh, in some cases, 200 trees per acre. It's not uncommon. How do you and when, even when the fire hits that, <clears throat> right. it's the nuclear option. Yeah, I was the just thinning, say, how does an elk get through that? The, the, <laughs> the thinning process uh, the, that needs to be done on watersheds is much more desirable than the nuclear option of having a fire come through here and burn it all to the ground. 
There are many things that can be done on watershed restoration projects, uh -huh. and they uh, have been doing quite a few of these across the state, primarily at lower elevations in the pinyon juniper. Uh, pinyon juniper areas um, is another where where conifer, pinyon junipers are conifers, and they have encroached into places that they never were. Uh, the Vernon Creek watershed is a great example of that, where um, they were able to take and remove a ton of the pinyon juniper and uh, increase some of the wa uh, water uh, coming down Vernon Creek itself. And uh, according to many of the old timers there, springs that had been dry for years, uh, uh, started flowing again. We covered kind of one uh, earlier in the show a few years ago uh, on watershed treatment that had done that down near Kanab. Mm -hmm. uh, and Hal Hamblin was one of the ranchers that had allotments that were covered on this. And his family had had that allotment for four generations. And he said that his grandfather, when he was very young, talked of springs and in, in this area, kind of out by uh, coral pink, mm -hmm. and he said the springs were gone. And one spring that barely produced anything, and it flows now, yeah. because they did this vegetation treatment, they did a reseed. Uh, the other nice benefit is you can actually see stuff. Yes, yes indeed. <laughs> uh, when you talk about uh, um, watershed management, mm -hmm. in this specifically related to, to water right here, uh, a lot of the conifers need to be taken out entirely to create the meadow effect. Create the meadow effect and that mosaic across the watershed right here that allows greater snowpack to accumulate. And one of the key factors is the restoration of aspen lands. Mm -hmm. um, some research done up at Utah State University right here, um, and this is fairly recent research, showed that the difference between aspens and conifers Mm -hmm. uh, the amount of water in the soil and the amount of water in the snowpack um, in this particular case was about 10 inches of water. And when you're only getting 22 inches of water a year, 10 inches is a huge amount of water. And we uh, took that even further and we started comparing the soil moisture under the aspens versus mm -hmm. the soil moisture under the conifers. So we know that there's less snow getting down there, but the conifers tend to uh, suck soil, uh, water out of the soil all year long. Mm. Even during the winter, there's uh, um, amounts really? of, of so they water don't go that are dormant like aspen. They're water. not. They're not as dormant as people might think they are. Huh. They're not taking a lot, but they continue to they do continue that to take uh, through that whole thing. And when we when we looked at it. Um, the conifers spent almost 65% of their time at a soil moisture condition that was unsustainable for grasses and forbs and other kinds of, we call it permanent wilting point, that the conifers are still alive because they have roots that go down and they're taking uh, water from deeper levels. And so they're able to survive, but everything else in that area would have died 65% uh, of the time. Yeah, you, that's why you don't hardly see anything around conifers. That's right. And when you compared that with the aspens, um, the aspens were only in that condition less than 10% of the time. So we only got three minutes left in this conversation. Mm -hmm. What do we do to fix it? Okay. We've done stories on controlled burns, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it doesn't sound like, to, in my opinion, they will cover exactly what you're talking about in creating meadows. We've also done shows on mechanical treatments that mm -hmm. have been developed uh, recently, and that they're pretty accurate of saying, okay, you can, you can work with a, a watershed manager and say, this would be a good area, and we need trees here, and we need that, and they basically can put it on a map and create it. And, and so are those, are those the right kind of tools that we need? If Randy Julander was king of the forest, that's precisely what we would be doing. We would be totally uh, cutting down a ton of trees, thinning the entire uh, area to begin with, and then cutting these mosaics in here, opening meadows and uh, total tree removal in some areas, not enough to generate floods and debris flows and things of that nature, but enough to increase your snowpack substantially uh, in the headwater regions of your watershed. So why don't forest managers pay more attention to guys like you? Um, <laughs> well, 
<laughs> you know, it's, it's an interesting thing. Uh, the pendulum swings back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I think this, the pendulum is, is coming back around. There, there are more and more people who are recognizing that our forests need a different... You get what you manage for, and what we have today, we have managed for. Okay, we're the, we're the problem right here. This is not the forest uh, from yesterday, from the turn of the century, the one that was resilient to fire, the one that could produce far more uh, water. The one that Teddy Roosevelt loved. <laughs> exactly, in that kind of a situation. I think we're seeing uh, more of a tendency to go back that direction. Um, there's a huge acknowledgement that fire is a huge problem and that thinning is the answer to that. Thinning is the answer to many yeah, things. This is a problem that's always troubled me, is if we use fire as the primary tool, mm -hmm. um, we run the potential, particularly when a controlled burn gets out. No, I don't know. I've seen five or six of those that mm -hmm. have happened in the last 10 years. Um, <clears throat> but one, you just have this huge air pollution problem right. that can't be good for mm -hmm. urbanized areas or for the environment in general. And you have, uh, you have, uh, scorched earth policies so much so that it seems to me it takes longer for things to regenerate in its path if the fire gets too hot and it damages the water. Hot. That's true. Uh, controlled burns are one of the least expensive ways of going about and doing that and that's one of the reasons they're favored. But um, I always say most people have this Disney-like vision of what Mother Nature is flying around on some unicorn sprinkling fairy dust. And she's not. Mother Nature is the green witch, and she's flying on her broom, and you're not going to like the way she handles things uh, if you let her have her way. Uh, uncontrolled forest fires coming across everywhere. That is scorched earth policy, and it is just, uh, and our forests are prime for that kind of situation. This has been most fascinating. So a mechanical treatment process, mm -hmm is the way to go, it's also going to be the hardest because, man, there is a lot of resistance to doing that. Absolutely. Uh, from, How do we overcome it? I remember um, sitting in various rooms saying, okay, how do we get a watershed treatment plan through that we can actually implement and do without being sued and having this plan delayed five, ten, who knows how many years? And that is the mentality that a lot of uh, watershed management has. At the, what can we do in which we can actually accomplish something? And I think with the thinning projects going on now, uh, the Biden administration has recognized that fire is a huge problem right here and that at least thinning, we would be doing, uh, thinning projects are going to be going on. And I think we have an opportunity to take a look at this from a watershed perspective and say, okay, how can we make uh, a thinning project and combine it with a watershed treatment program that will create ways of increasing snow and getting it right to the channel and therefore increasing stream flow. My thanks to you for spending time, Randy. Appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in and following this. Uh, many more discussions to come. Probably another one with, uh, with Randy Julander. We'll talk to you later. See you next week.